Hey everyone, thank you for joining me for a very special interview. We have the one and only Glenn Hudson, who I'm sure you've been picking up on uh, other platforms and YouTube. Glenn and I have been in communication now through our own Facebook group pages with Marine Apparitions and of course Glenn is the, the message of Garabindal. And after so many years back and forth, um, helping one another, speaking and doing a lot that we can, he's finally got onto the YouTube channel here and has agreed to do an interview with myself. So, Glenn, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've been looking forward to this for a very long time, my friend. Thank you so much for giving us your precious time. Thank you, Mark, for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. So we're going to take for granted that people have already watched some videos in the recent interviews as well, and it's going to be up on the video anyway for the timeline, the main messages. But I'd like the idea if I can ask you some more questions that maybe we could elaborate further, clear anything up, and whatever comes through you, um, we'll take that as always um, into our hearts. But uh, before we begin, I thought it'd be best maybe just start with a quick prayer. Would that be all right? Yeah. Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we give you thanks for the gift of Glenn and for all he's doing to spread uh, the messages of Garib and Dal. We thank you, Most Holy Mother, for your maternal love and for all that you continue to do to help us grow closer to you, to your Son, Jesus, and this path of holiness. We ask you to protect us, inspire Glenn for everything he wishes to say, and may it hit the ears and hearts of everyone who comes to find this interview. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, Glenn. So if we start off then, obviously, tell us about yourself. How did you come to know, uh, how did you come to do this work regarding Garib and Dal? And is there not quite a special story like a God incident, how it all came about for you? Yeah, it's, it's actually quite an interesting story over uh, over a lot of decades. Um, I was a young boy, uh, about 13 years old. I was a pretty big kid playing American football, and uh, I wanted to be a, a linebacker, but I wasn't fast enough. So I, the harder I worked out and harder I ran, the, the more my legs hurt and the slower I got. So my mother... Took, finally took me to the doctors and they x-rayed my legs and they found out I had a bone marrow disease in my legs. And uh, it kept softening the bone marrow. So it was having a difficult time supporting my body weight. And that's why I was in so much pain. So um, simultaneously, one of my aunts, uh, my mother's sister, uh, was having Joey Lamagino over her house. She used to open her house up so Joey could do talks about Garabindel and show people the, uh, the large medal that Conchita gave him that the Blessed Mother kissed. And what made this unique, this medal, is many people received miracles uh, when they venerated this medal. So my aunt called my mother and said, listen, you know, I, I have this guy coming over, talk about Garabindel, he has this medal, why don't you bring Glenn and, you know, maybe something will happen. So, you know... At, at 13, you, you'll try anything to get well. So I go, I listen to him and, you know, kind of half-heartedly. And at the end, I kiss the medal and, you know, I don't feel anything. But two weeks later, my mother takes me back to the doctors for a checkup. They take a new set of x-rays and my legs are completely healed. Wow. So now, 20 years goes by. Now, one of my aunt's next-door neighbors also was involved in the Garabindel apostolate. And because our families were so close, uh, I became very good friends with her son, Peter. And uh, Peter had invited me to go listen to a guy talking about a Marian apparition in Spain, some blind guy. And I, I, I said, you know, I, I don't really want to go. <laughs> I, it didn't sound that interesting. I thought, I don't, I don't really want to go. But he, he was insistent about going. And he said, listen, you know, Padre Pio is behind this apparition. I said, Padre Pio, all right, I'll go and listen. And then we walk into what is Joey Lamagino's house, uh, which was the New York Garabindel Center. And I say to Peter, I know this guy. He goes, what do you mean? I said, I know this guy. I've met him. He goes, that's impossible. I said, no, I, I met him 20 years ago at my aunt's house. And I said, I had a healing on my legs from him. 
So Peter's shocked. And so, you know, we stay, we listen to Joey talk and I wait till everybody leaves. And I, I go up to Joey and I say, you know, you probably won't remember me, but I was uh, Dolly Glass's nephew. I, I got a healing from this, uh, you know, from, from the kissed metal. And I said, I, you know, I'd like to help out at the apostolate. And he was, he was thrilled. And uh, so I spent about the first two years um, you know, just making rosaries, you know, doing deliveries, sending stuff to the post office and, and reading. Uh, the great thing was I had every book written on Carabindel in front of me. So I got to read all of the books. And what was nice about the New York Center was I got to see Joey every day and, and Conchita would stop down. So slowly I, you know, became friends with her and, and, and started to talk to her about questions before I, kind of knew her too well i was surprised that she she you know answered a lot of the things that i i tested her with so i had this amazing introduction of of reading all the materials seeing joey every day asking him questions asking conchita questions and about two years after that you know joey had realized that i wasn't exactly shy and he he had he made me the director of public relations uh, for the New York Center, and he said, you know, why don't you go out and start speaking about Garabindel? And that's what I did, and, you know, in small groups. And then in 2009, I got the idea of, you know, I was on Facebook, and I had uh, called Joey and Conchita and said, you know, let, let's talk about this. I have an idea about putting, you know, the, the, the video that we just made. Uh, let's put it on fa this thing called Facebook. And I said, I'll open up a page and, and I can answer questions. I said, I can do more good for you sitting at home than I can here at the center. So that's basically how it evolved in 2009. I had no members, nothing. Uh, and now I have, I think it's uh, 92,000 members. And um, uh, about a year or so ago, I, I received a, a message, which I believe uh, Mary wanted me to know. Uh, to to expand, so I now post in 15 languages every day. So uh, each page gets the same message, but now it's in 15 languages as opposed to one. And um, the nice thing is, my English page is basically the only page that Conchita speaks to on the entire internet. <clears throat> so one of the benefits is uh, having access to her, uh, a 30 year friendship. And um, also, you'll see a lot of personal stories about her and her life um, that she's allowed me to post. Yeah, it sounds an absolute remarkable story. No doubt the, the hand of God's at work in that for sure. And even with the amount of hours that you do in all those pages, I mean, it's a full time job in itself. So no doubt you're <laughs> going to get some special graces from heaven for that. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, yeah, God was uh, generous enough to allow me to uh, uh, retire from my, my full-time job in 2020. And I thought, wow, this is going to be great. I'm going to have a nice, relaxing uh, retirement. And uh, that didn't quite happen, but that's okay. I, I like my new boss much better. Good, good. Well, whatever's happened since 2023 kicked in, Garabindal seems yet again to take this other wave of popularity or trending i know in the last couple of years we've seen such a, a big increase in people looking up garabindal and talking about it and all that but i was wanting to go back to maybe seeing why garabindal occurred and i've been in garabindal myself a couple of years ago and the impressions i got and even with mario loli's family all this stuff the only thing i was wanting to kind of bring in with why she appeared there is maybe some sort of continuance with fatima um, because Lucia Fatima said uh, that the consecration had to be done by 1960. That's the consecration of Russia. Do you think Garabindal occurred deliberately as a, a continuation of Fatima due to the consecration not being done by 1960? Well, I definitely feel that Garabindal is the continuation of Fatima, and I have a strong belief as to why I, I believe that. Um, I think it was more uh, directed towards the third secret of Fatima. Uh, Sister Lucia was adamant about them reading it uh, because there were some prophecies in there in the future, and she wanted that read by, by 1960. And when uh, John, uh, Pope John the 23rd, 
uh, did not read this message, um, it was I, I think it was not only upsetting to the sister, but uh, more, more importantly, the Blessed Mother, um, I think, was depending on these messages uh, of these prophecies being read. And so what happens is the very next year, she appears at Garabandel, 1961. She didn't waste any time. And then there's some interesting uh, coincidences. Um, when Sister Lucia was leaving for the convent um, in 1921, um, she had a vision, a last vision of, of Mary. Um, and isn't it funny how uh, 40 years later, 1961, same exact day, uh, St. Michael appears. Uh, at Garabandel, his first appearance at Garabandel, which starts the whole apparition. Um, so that was uh, June, 8, uh, June 18th, 1961. So there's a, there's a connection right there. You have, it, it follows Fatima. Uh, you have the 40 year to the day uh, connection. And uh, also one of the uh, interesting things is Mary appeared in Fatima uh, in the sixth apparition, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And when she appears in July of 61 in Garabandel, she's our, our Lady of Mount Carmel again. So, you know, there's a nice little connection that, that weaves the, the two apparitions together. Yeah, I mean, I know we could dig in more and more to that as well. And even some of the ones yeah. that have done, it's there. But there's definitely a clear continuance for sure. And the more yeah. boldness of her messages at Garabandel. It's, it's um, sure. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, there's a, there's an interesting quote from actually uh, the one-time Bishop of Fatima. If, if you'd like me to read it, um, he was uh, uh, vocal about his opinion of Garabandel. Yes, and I'll yes, read it please. So that it's correct. Um, this is in, from 1983 from Bishop Benaccio. This message given by the Blessed Virgin at Garabandel is the same as the one given at Fatima, but it is updated. At Garabandel, Mary came to upgrade her message given at Fatima to new conditions of the church and the world. It is obvious to me that the message of Our Lady of Mount Carmel is a message of salvation for our time. Yes, without any doubt, but perhaps much more. So I think that's interesting that the bishop himself of Fatima yeah. Uh, sees the, the connection of the two apparitions. Yeah, absolutely, because no doubt he's got probable knowledge as well of Fatima, and then he hears all about the messages in Garabandal, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, picking up then with the bishop, as soon as you hear the clergy, bishops, Fatima, and all different things mixed, that, that specific message that she gave, the second message... Um, on about the clergy on the road to perdition, you know, many priests, many bishops, many cardinals on the road to perdition, uh, less and less reverence given to the Eucharist. And again, this is back in the 60s. Did Our Lady still state, though, that obedience to the church is that still of the utmost importance? Yes. You know, she actually pointed out uh, two types of obedience. One, she initiated with the girls themselves that they should be obedient to their parents. Um, that was the first thing she brought to them, um, regardless of how they felt uh, about uh, being obedient uh, to their parents. She stressed this, which I think is really important uh, as a good mother. You know, she, she, she looks after these girls and tries to give them daily lessons, uh, including uh, obedience to your parents. But she also gives the greatest example of obedience to the church. In the beginning of the apparitions, um, the apparitions started to take place in the church itself. The girls would go into an ecstatic state. And uh, if, if they were in the church, the townspeople would rush to the church to witness the ecstasies. And, and, and as more people came into the town, the, the ch church became packed with so many people that the, the pastor was afraid, you know, they were going to start breaking things. It was just way too many people. So the pastor asked the girls, please ask Mary not to have these ecstasies 
inside the church. And Mary, showing the greatest example of obedience, she obeys the pastor and, and has all the rest of the uh, ecstasies and apparitions outside the church. So if Mary herself will obey a, a priest, just to make an example, I, I think it's, it's undeniable that she expects us to be obedient also, whether we like it or not. Yeah, for sure. And it's always obedience. I mean, it's obedience or disobedience when it goes back to even the beginning of Scripture, isn't it? Obedience, obedience. Keeping with the priest theme then, it brings me to the next question. Who was the priest who died after seeing the miracle while the girls were in ecstasy? Can you tell us a bit more about him and what happened? Yeah, I I, uh, I call him the fifth visionary. There were the four girls and then there was Father Luis Andreo. And what happens in uh, August of uh, 1961, August 8th, uh, he hears about these uh, apparitions and he has uh, brothers that are also priests and they all hear about these apparitions and he wants to go there and, and investigate it himself. And while he's there, um, he actually goes into ecstasy with the girls that day. And he has the vision of Mary that they have. And he is also given a view of the future miracle. And he screams out, milagro, milagro, a miracle in, in Spanish. So he's acknowledging to the people who are watching that not only is he seeing Mary also, but he's actually witnessing the, the future miracle that she talked about. So when they come out of ecstasy, um, he explains to them, you know, what he saw. And, and so other people witnessed this conversation. That's how the story, um, you know, became noted was uh, the witnesses and the girls both corroborate that he saw Mary and that he uh, witnessed the miracle. And, um, that night, he's heading home in a car with a friend, and um, he slightly starts to lean to one side. He coughs, and he dies in the car. And one of the interesting things is that uh, later on in uh, another appearance to the girls, Mary tells them that Father Andreo is going to speak to them. And Father Andreo not only speaks to the girls, and this is like a, um, a locution. You, they hear the voice, and not so much a vision of him, but they hear his voice, and they, they testify that it's exactly the same voice. And he goes on to talk to them about certain things and also gives messages for his brother, who was a priest, Father Ramon Andreo. Right. And that's a confirmation that it was him because the things that he told the girls um, were were only known to his brother. So his brother corroborated that it was him. Now, one of, one of the, the most interesting things is uh, we talk about this future miracle. Mary prophesied in 1964 that the day after the miracle, and I'm, I, I try to make this as clear as I can, the day after the miracle, uh, they're going to actually dig up uh, Father Andreo's uh, coffin, and he's going to be found incorrupt mm -hmm. as a confirmation of the miracle the day prior. Now, there was a rumor in the 70s that they had moved all the bodies from the original grave uh, that he was buried in. And they opened his casket and he was found, uh, you know, decomposed. That's not true. Uh, I know this rumor got out and I think it was set up by people who are anti garabandel But I have a letter uh, on my website that I provide that the, the head of his order told them specifically, when you move all of these graves, his is not to be uh, opened, his coffin. That is to re remain to be closed. So I have this letter. So that dispels that rumor that his coffin was open. Um, and, and quite honestly, it, it doesn't matter to me because even if they did open it, which they didn't, 
Mary said the day after the miracle. So it's, it actually would even have been a greater thing if they thought he was decomposed already and then he appeared incorrupt on the day after the miracle. But I hope that straightens out that internet rumor that kind of um, uh, confused people. And I think it was meant to try to, uh, you know, try to knock Garabandel down as not being true. Yeah, for sure. For all the years of heard of Garabandal and looked into it all myself that was the first time I heard about that and um, so I'm glad you've brought that in there because that would have been something new for me as well and um, you have mentioned the miracle quite a bit we're going to come to that I mean it might have been a good time to ask but I'm just looking at the list there it'll run better when we start talking about the warning then the miracle and that timeline but if I could just uh, sway it to the next question then is that uh, many famous saints, including one of my own favourite, St. Pio, Padre Pio, and St. Mother Teresa. I mean, all these famous saints seem to have a connection with Garabandal, but are there any others? And uh, what can you tell us about the Garabandal believers and their connection to the visionaries? Yeah, well, we always love to start with Padre Pio because I call him the saviour of Garabandal. Because early on, he was uh, quite vocal about his belief in the apparitions. And I think if it wasn't for him in the beginning, a lot of people would have fallen away and, and disbelieved. Um, and when people question Garabandel, I say, the first question I ask them, I said, who is spiritually wiser than, than St. Pio? Um, you know, it, he's... I don't think you can question anything he says. I mean, I, I understand he's human, but the gifts that he was given by God are so unique and so powerful. Uh, I, I don't think you can question his opinion. And he was adamant about his belief in Garabandel. And, you know, he wrote letters, personal letters to the girls, especially Conchita. He had a special bond with Conchita. There's stories that he bilocated to see Conchita in Garabandel several times. Um, and I think one of the most telling things about uh, St. Pio is that when he passed, he bequeathed to Conchita his, one of his uh, bloodstained gloves uh, with a bandage, uh, his personal rosary, and one of the veils that covered his face during his wake. So if think about it. Uh, all the people in the world that Padre Pio knew, he chooses Conchita to give these special gifts to. So to me, that that's not only a confirmation, but it's undeniable um, that he believed in it and that it was true. Now, uh, Mother Teresa's name comes up. Uh, Conchita's husband was very, uh, uh, very active with uh, Mother's Order in New York, volunteered a lot, did, did a lot for them. And eventually, uh, Mother Teresa uh, and Conchita's family became very friendly. And whenever she was in New York, you know, she would stop by Conchita's house. So there's, you know, there's quite a bit of photographic proof of, of the two of them together. Uh, and she also was adamant about uh, her belief in Garabandel. And she told her order um, that it was true. And I, and I always think it's amazing that the people who try to knock Garabandel saying it's condemned, it was never condemned. Because... The Vatican never said anything to Padre Pio or Mother Teresa, and they were speaking publicly. They were never ordered to be silent. So that's, that's proof right there that Garabandel was never condemned. Mm -hmm. Now you can add on top of that some, some pretty great saints. So you have St. Pio, Mother Teresa. You have John Paul II, also a believer in Garabandel. Um, and met with Mary Lowley um, and was very excited to meet her family and blessed her family. Uh, Pope Paul VI, uh, also another believer, now also a saint, another very vocal, many quotes by him. And uh, I'll get into later that he actually met Conchita and, and uh, they had an interview. Um, Jose Maria Scriva is another name. Um, yeah. Mother Miravallis, another saint. And, and it goes on and on. So quite a few people uh, of, of, of good character uh, believe in Garabandel. 
Yes, to say the least. The only one I would point out as well there, because it was the other night I watched a little bit of Unstoppable Waterfall again, and I know that Mother Angelica says her cameras will be there for the miracle. <laughs> so again, another believer, and we're hearing more stories of her um, private life um, as a saint probably in the making as well. But yeah, the, the list seems to keep growing all the time the more we find these things out. When you've mentioned Joey already, and then we're just mentioning Padre Pio as the saviour. I know Joey was very instrumental in the beginning of the communication and all his stories, as I know you've repeated many times. But there was a big um, shock that came to us all there a few years ago when Joey sadly passed. Um, I saw you doing a lot of defending of Garabindal. Um, so how did you go about defending Garabindal after his passing and still uh, remain a believer when others didn't? Because there was a clear prophecy about Joey, wasn't there? Yeah, I, I think the problem is that A, uh, people only listen to what they hear on the internet and don't do any research. So there were a lot of conditions, first of all. So let's start with what was what did Mary actually say? Because this this phrase has been twisted and changed a hundred times, but the actual words that she told Conchita is that Joey will see on the very day of the miracle. So that's the exact wording. Joey will see the very day of the miracle. So, well, actually, whether he's living or dead, he, he is going to see the miracle. Um, but that's the first thing they should understand. Those were the exact words. Now, most people have never heard this, that this promise came with conditions, prayer conditions. And Joey was told to say 17 Hail Marys, seven acts of contrition, and five Our Fathers three times a day. Okay? So a lot of people have never even heard that. Me neither. And, yeah. And in the later part of his life, especially the last two years of his life, um, he suffered terribly. Uh, he had somewhere in the neighborhood of, of like 10, you know, minor heart attacks. Um, he fell down a flight of stairs in his house. He misjudged where he was. Uh, some of the medications that he was given uh, had terrible reactions. Um, so he suffered so much in the, in the last few years of his life. So... Was he able to continually complete those prayer requests that Mary asked for? Now, one of the most telling things is in December of 62, Conchita has a locution with Jesus. And he tells her that before the miracle, something will happen that will cause many to disbelieve in the apparitions. So I can't think of another thing, I mean, other than Conchita dying. God forbid. But I can't think of another thing that would impact the apostolate and the Garabindel message as much as Joey passing. So, but there's actually a prophecy that talks about that, and this is documented. So, we have that also. Was he actually part of this prophecy? Now, the, uh, probably the most interesting thing that happened is, you know, I have this long-term friendship with Conchita, and, and this does, you know, still bother me to this day that he's that he passed i mean i miss him uh, greatly but i i sat down and talked to her last year about joey's passing i said listen you know i'm always on the internet and i hear a thousand rumors i said there's a rumor going around that a priest said that joey offered his sufferings up and that he wanted to be united in christ uh, un united with Christ in his sufferings and that he offered up all of the sufferings that he had so that Garabindel would be accepted and approved by the church. So I said, is that rumor true? Did you hear that? And Conchita says, that wasn't a priest. I said, oh, okay. She said, that was me. <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> I said, I, di I didn't know that. <laughs> so she told me she was with Joey uh, near the end. 
right. and he told her that. So to me, it, it just kind of relieved that little bit of pressure on my shoulders that's always kind of been there. Like now I feel completely 100% okay with, with his passing. If Jesus said something's going to happen, uh, you know, that would cause disbelief that he was so, so gravely ill that he couldn't complete his, you know, prayer request that Mary asked for. Um, and then what Conchita told me. So, and she said, basically, what are you worried about? He, he's in heaven with Padre Pio right now. And I said, uh, I, I assume you're right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's quite unique again for all the years on the page and, you know, don't always pick up everything and, and looking at him own stuff. There's even from the interviews you've done recently, there's still something there that I'm like, it's just hit me fresh. So this is why it's always good to keep this going. Like you say, there's so many things on the internet, but at least we're getting the story straight with having you doing this interview and any others. So again, thank you. I'm really, really taking a lot from what you're saying. Uh, just to move on to that next question then, uh, again, there's something else very clearly stated with Garib and Dal about the four more popes after John the Twenty Third, which would take us to Pope Benedict the Sixteenth as that fourth pope. What effect has the death of Pope Benedict had on the Garabandal prophecies? I'm glad you brought this up because probably one of the most confusing uh, things that was said at Garabandal is this issue of, is it three popes or four popes? Now, again, because people don't bother to research anything, they take from the internet what they hear or what somebody else posted. Um, and because of my extensive library, I was able to find uh, several examples, not one, but several examples of Mary's conversation with Conchita. And the problem is nobody goes past the first sentence. Mary opens up the conversation saying there's going to be three more popes till the end of times, the end of the times, not the end of all time, the end of the times, meaning an era. The next sentence, she immediately says, but I didn't count one of them because of his short reign. So if people had read the second sentence, they would certainly understand immediately that it wasn't three. It really was four because of the passing of John Paul I, who only had a 33-day reign. So then if you go back, you have your four popes after John the Twenty-Third. You have Paul VI. John Paul I, John Paul II, and now with the passing of Benedict, clearly you have your four popes. So that, to me, marks uh, a division of time, because she said that would be the end of the times. And that means that's the end of that era. Now we're going to enter a new era. And that new era now is what, what I consider really God's last act of mercy. It's, it's all about salvation, his last ditch effort for salvation for the planet. And that's going to start with the warning, the miracle. And then if people don't repent enough, there, there could be a, uh, what we call in Garabandel, a conditional chastisement. There's, there's also an interesting fact of Pope Sylvester. Uh, in the 300s, was Pope. He died also on the same day as Benedict, uh, December 31st. And what's interesting about the two popes is, I just explained how Benedict's uh, passing uh, enters in a new era. Uh, the same thing happened with Pope Sylvester. Uh, he ushered in a new era of formalized Catholicism uh in rome doing away with paganism through uh, the council of nicaea and the edict of milan so it's interesting that the two popes die on the same day and both uh usher in new eras uh that that are greatly affecting the church or will affect the church the next question i do have for you is uh what are the things leading up to this so-called warning as we also know it's called the illumination of conscience so what, what are the signs leading up to the warning okay so mary basically gave conchita uh mostly conchita and a little bit to a mary lily 
three specific events that are going to happen prior to the warning. So the first thing was a synod. Um, now, the interesting thing about the synod is the church really didn't adopt officially synods until 1967. So that Mary mentions this many years earlier than that confused a lot of people. So when Kachita says there would be an important synod, they were like, what do you mean, like a council? And she said, no, a synod. And, you know, one great thing that I, I picked up is the word synod, this is a 12-year-old mountain girl <laughs> with a very limited education. Uh, where did she come up with the word synod? So anybody who doubts, uh, you know, Kachita as a visionary, this, this, there's no way this girl could have come up when most of the, the adults never heard the word, didn't even know what it was. And, and, and that always reminds me of St. Bernadette at Lourdes. When she's given the word the Immaculate Conception, the bishop knows she's telling the truth because there's no way this young girl who was, you know, uh, undereducated could possibly come up with this word. So I always thought that the, the, the use of the word synod uh, kind of connects, um, you know, truth to to the visions. Um, so that's the first uh, event. The second one she talked about, which was also just as confusing, she says, when communism returns. So now in, in the early 1960s, people are saying, what does that mean? Where, where's communism going? But we see later, you know, 30 years later, the, the dissolving of uh, the Soviet Union. Um, and it's quite apparent look around the world, you can see communism uh, starting to come back and, and being affected through many governments. Uh, even here in America, we see things that I never thought we'd see in, you know, in politics. So that was the second. Now, the third is a conditional chastisement um, that she talks about. And that's only dependent on the Pope going to Moscow. Now, no pope has ever gone to Moscow. So you can see that a Pope Francis has been adamant, uh, especially the last few years, about going to Moscow. Now, you can't just invite yourself. You have to be invited. So I, I believe there's only two people that with the, with the power to invite him, and that's uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, Patriarch Kirill. Um, and neither has extended an official invitation yet. And it makes me believe that Pope Francis is aware of the Garabindel prophecy because he's been asking since 2017. So if you, if you go back in time and, and look in some of the news articles, this isn't a new thing that he's been re requesting in the last year. He knows that he is part of prophecy. And he must make this trip. And I think that's why he's pushing so hard uh, to go to Moscow. Now, once these three events have taken place, when he returns home, uh, back to the Vatican from this trip to Moscow, there's a prophecy also that hostilities will break out in Europe and things are going to get a lot worse. And then when they're at their worst, uh, Mary Lowley said when they're at their worst, then God will bring the warning to stop everything. So I know everyone's concerned about a World War III and a nuclear war and all of these things. So I have to believe that um, as bad as it will get, a, a God will stop everything with the warning and then bring the miracle and then give us a chance to repent so that there won't be uh, a chastisement. Yeah, please God not. And more people are getting these messages in time and converting. Uh, so yeah, we've got the the warning, the miracle, and the conditional chastisement. Now that you've done a good part there with the warning and the signs leading to it, what can you tell us about the great miracle that's to come after the warning? Okay, so we, we were given also a lot of details about that. Um, so we know that uh, Mary told Kachita that it's going to happen. Uh, initially, Kachita said in March, April, or May. That was her initial statement. 
So it was in that three month uh, span of time. Uh, my personal opinion is that it's going to happen in April. And the reason I say that is through putting interviews together and reading books, I found two passages that kind of pinpoint the month of April. Um, in 1965, Conchita tells Father Morolos that it's, it's not in May. He wants to know the month. And she won't give him the month, but she says, it's not in May. And, th and then 20 years later, in 1985, she's being interviewed by Harry Daly, who writes the book uh, Miracle at Garabandel. And he also is obviously pushing her for uh, a more accurate description of the actual month. And she won't give that, but she says, all I can tell you is it's either April or May. So now, if you take the two conversations, she already told Father Morolos that it's not in May, and she tells Harry Daly it's either April or May. So I, I think we're only left with one conclusion, that it, it's going to be April. Now, she also left that it's going to happen on the feast of a young male martyr of the Eucharist. It's going to happen on a Thursday night between the 8th and the 16th at 8.30 p.m. Spanish time. Um, so those, those are pretty, uh, detailed description, uh, of, of when it's going to happen. Now, the miracle itself is a, like a two stage event. There's going to be an initial stage where something happens at the pines where Mary appeared many of the times, these nine pine trees in Garbondale. So there's going to be like an, an initial maybe 15 minute event, uh, above the pines. And then after that, there's going to be a permanent sign left. So it's it's really two stage, two different things, some type of ongoing event for, she said, roughly 15 minutes. Uh, I don't think she wanted to be quoted to the exact time, but uh, just as a reference. And then a permanent sign is going to be left. And also, if you remember what I told you before, the day after the miracle, they're going to exhume uh, Father Andreo's uh, a coffin, and he'll be found incorrupt. So that's another proof of the miracle. Now, one of the the greatest promises was that anybody who's in attendance for the miracle will be healed. So any physical healment or any spiritual ailment or emotional ailment, um, even disbelievers will be converted. So that's a great promise uh, that Mary made that anybody in attendance at, at, at Garavandel, and it's a huge mountain range, so it, it can hold quite quite a bit of people. Um, anybody in attendance will will be granted this miracle. Yeah, I'm just picturing the mountain range myself when I was there two years ago, and I know I put some uh, videos back then up on the on your Facebook group page. Because this little hamlet village in the mountains is so tranquil and peaceful. It hasn't modernized to that extent like other shrines. And I'm thinking, how are the people going to be there of the miracle if they're in their thousands? But you've got a lot of mountain range surrounding that 360 degree circle of all the mountains around Garb and Dal. It would be spectacular and it's probably beyond anything we can imagine. Um, hopefully eight days notice Conchita's given us that we'll, we'll be there in time <laughs> yes that's true she's uh, she's going to notify me uh, at midnight of the eighth day before and um, I'm going to disseminate that message as quickly as possible through obviously all the uh, Garabandel pages I write for uh, your page obviously uh, and uh, <laughs> And any 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 and all media outlets that I can uh, get them to post it, so we'll get it out as quickly as possible. Yeah, great, great. Uh, so we're coming towards the end of the last couple of ones. All this prophesied future events, and we can already see some things tick in the boxes for these times, as we've already highlighted. Uh, but the one big thing, maybe, I think maybe it was touched a little earlier when you mentioned Pope Paul VI and, and that, but where does Garabindal stand with the church? 
Okay, so let's establish right off the bat, it's never been condemned. So this is the big thing on the internet. People say it's 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 not approved, it's and or it's condemned. Those two things let's tackle. A never been condemned ever. There's no proof of that. It, there's because I've checked all the Vatican records. There's nothing. Uh, you can check for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. There are there is no condemnation of this written by anybody. So that's the first thing. When people say it's not approved. I say that's partially true. It's not approved yet because there is an open case filed with um, he was at, was actually filed with uh, Pope Benedict when he was Cardinal Ratzinger in 1988. Um, one one of the interesting stories about Gary Vidal is when the initial commission was formed to try and knock down the the apparitions, actually, the priest that was the head of the commission actually resigned because he was so convinced that what he was witnessing was true, he actually resigns from the commission. So, as fate would have it, he later becomes the Bishop of Santander, and he starts his own commission. And that report is the only report that is ever sent to the Vatican. So none of the early bishops ever sent a report to the Vatican because they there was no way they could disprove these. So that that story did go to Cardinal Ratzinger, and that is still an open case. Now, I had mentioned before that Kachita met with uh, Pope Paul VI in January of 1966. And, but she initially, in Rome, at the Vatican, met with Cardinal Ottaviani for two and a half hours, and he was so convinced that he set up a private in, uh, a private meeting, really, with Pope Paul VI the next day. And during that, he's so convinced that Conchita's telling the truth, he's recorded as saying, Conchita, I bless you, and the whole church blesses you. So you, you have this now of him not releasing any statement because he's given the date of the miracle. So I guess in prudence, the church figures, well, if we have the date of the miracle, why don't we just wait till that date and then we can declare it true when it happens on that day. And that's basically the stance that the church has. Now, the church has three specific terms for all apparitions. You know, basically, one, it's true. One, it's not true. The third one is the category that Garabandel is in. It's called non constat the supernatural taste. <laughs> Say that three times fast. <laughs> uh, and what that means is they're uncertain of the supernatural event. So they're not condemning it. They're not approving it. They're just going to kind of wait it out to see if this day happens as it was prophesied. You know, and I and I said earlier, notice they never silenced Padre Pio, they never silenced uh, Mother Teresa, they never silenced Pope John Paul II, all vocal, you know, uh, proponents um, of Garabandel. So it's in, it's, you can, you know, no, no one is obligated to believe in any apparition that isn't approved by the church, but this is not condemned and, and it is still open investigation. It's just a typical prudence of Mother Church, and again, it goes back to us obeying that, isn't it? But yeah, the clarity is so important to have, and thanks for clearing that up for us. Uh, just coming towards the end here then, with um, all all these events from the 60s, the story, the journey, the things coming to the future, you know, we're talking, what, what over half a century later... So what have the visionaries done since the 1960s, and what are they doing now? Well, unfortunately, Mary Lowley passed away in 2009 from uh, health complications of lupus and some other things. Um, Mary Cruz has moved away from Garamandel about 100 miles or so. Uh, she's moved away, and um, while she occasionally visits, she's not very vocal, Um about the apparitions itself. Uh, Jacinta lives in California, and uh, she has been known to do 
um, some public speaking. But uh, the bulk of it fell on Conchita's shoulders because she was the main visionary. So for the first 20 years of the apparitions, she did everything asked of her. She did, you know, interviews. She did television. She did radio. She commented, you know, in books. Uh, she wrote a diary. And I, I asked her this question, you know, years ago. Um, I, I took the advantage and said to her, you know, like, why have you been silent, you know, lately, you know? And she said, Glenn, I did everything for 20 years. I've said everything I can say. I've given every piece of information. It's all out there. But people still didn't listen to me. So it was a little, a little disheartening to hear her say that. You know, there's a certain sadness in her voice. So that's why she doesn't really comment. There's really nothing else that she can add. She has talked about every prophecy, every event, what's going to happen, what to do to avert that chastisement. So what else is she supposed to do? Um, and that's kind of where my role comes in now is sh sh she's, uh, you know, graciously allowed me to open this page and, and speak about Garibadell, answer the questions, tell personal stories about her and, and, and kind of, you know, pick up where, where Joey left off and continue this apostolate work. And you're doing fine work indeed. <laughs> so Thank the last you. the last thing for Conchita then is she's just waiting for that eight day notification before the miracle. Yeah, that that's really her last, you know, uh, a, a vocational task, if you will, of, of all the things she's been asked to do. That's the last thing she has to do. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. I know it's very precious, even with your regular day of all those Facebook groups and messages, but I know you're getting asked quite a bit for interviews, and I'm so humbled and so thankful that you've taken your time uh, to come onto my channel and speak with me, and long may our, our journey in friendship and collaboration with the Facebook pages continue, all for the glory of God, and getting our ladies' uh, messages and the truth of them out there. Uh, I would just like to invite you, therefore, if you have any final words, you know, maybe comment on all that you're seeing in the world and the church and what we should be doing. Uh, do you see any obvious times we are in like never before? Because I could speak on that for quite a bit, but I'm restraining myself. But yeah, I mean, everything's so much at a focus and so quickly on the internet and all over the place and all divisional talks. And then we see everything happening in the world. What would you say, any final words of encouragement or taking in everything that we've been discussing so far? You know, uh, just like you, I, I could go on and speak probably for another half an hour on, on that subject. But I want to give people the a brief but poignant uh, story. I think the most important thing the Blessed Mother ever said in the four years of Garabandel, she said, Above all, just lead good lives. How simple is that? We, we know what to do. We know, we know what we should be doing. We know the things that she wants. She wants, you know, frequent confession, daily mass, communion, say the rosary. You know, the, these simple things, acts of penance. We all know what to do. So I think that was the most important thing she ever said, even more important than the, the prophecies. She said, just lead good lives. And, you know, again, I go back to what Conchita said. Out of the thousands of things that she said, it's not the prophecies that are important at all. She said, live the messages. Those, just those three words sums up all of Garabandel. She even said, it's not important to believe, believe in the apparitions, but just live Mary's messages. So live the messages. Perfect. Glenn Hudson, thank you very much for your time. God bless all that you're doing. Mark, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, I'm blessed to have you as a friend and, and blessed to be on uh, with your, your group today. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>